Well, guys, first of all, I, I don't even, I'm, I'm so excited to be here. I've never preached at Bellevue Church, ever. So it's been a lifelong dream, and I, I got so much I want to say, I kind of feel like a mosquito in the nudist camp. I don't even know where to start. Um, <laughs> let that sink in just a minute, okay? First of all, I want to tell you unequivocally, I love your pastor. I love Steve Gaines. I thank God for your pastor. He is one of the great men of God in our convention. I'm grateful for uh, you, one of the great young pastors in our convention, J.D. Greer. I was telling J.D. it's just an honor to be uh, up here with him. And I just have to tell you, you, you know, I'm, you're probably wondering, well, so James, how did you get here? I mean, since you've never preached here and this is your first shot, so how did it happen? So I was just going to tell you how it happened. Uh, I've, I've preached in a lot of places. I've preached in some, a lot of great places, but I've never preached at Bellevue. And so about Three years ago, I called Steve. I felt like I had the liberty to do it. I said, Steve, man, I said, I would really, really love to come to preach at Bellevue. There was a pause, and Steve said, uh, James, you're just not ready. <laughs> hung up. So I told Teresa about it. I said, what do, you, what do I do? She said, well, give it about a, give it about a year. So I, about a year later passed by, and I called Steve. I said, Steve, I said, man, I've really been praying about it, fasting, 40 days, nothing but water. <laughs> I, I really would love to preach at Bellevue. There was a pause. He said, James, you're still not ready. Hung up. I went and told Teresa. So I said, what do I do? She said, give it one more shot. Give it about a year. So I called Steve not long ago. I said, Steve, I really want to come to Bellevue. I said, I'll tell you what. I said, if you will let me come to Bellevue. I'll pay my own expenses. He said, James, you're ready. <laughs> so, Steve, thank you, brother, for letting me come. God bless you. Appreciate it very much. Well, men, if you brought a copy of God's Word, I want you to turn to the book of Daniel, chapter 3. Daniel, chapter 3. And while you're turning, let me tell you a story. It happened about 70 years ago. It's a fascinating story. There was a man named Wagner Dodge. He was a professional firefighter known as a smoke jumper. If you know anything about firefighting, you know that smoke jumpers fly right into the center of forest fires. They parachute in, and their job is to stop the flames. Well, Dodge had a 15-man crew, and so they get, get into this plane. They're going to Man Gulch in central Montana. They parachute in. Look like a pretty normal operation. They're heading single file down this gorge toward the Missouri River to take on this fire. So he left these men up on a ridge and said, you men stay here. Let me go scout the fire out, and I'll tell you what we need to do. As he got within 100 feet of that fire, he saw three things that would absolutely change his life forever. First of all, the fire was much worse than what he saw from the air, and the wind was causing the fire to move a lot faster than he realized. Second, the winds that were blowing the fire blew the fire above the gulch where he'd left the men all the way up to the ridge, cutting off any way of escape. Third, as he ran back to his men and ordered them to retreat, he realized that this gulch was in what is known as a transitional zone. Now, if you're a firefighter, you know what that is. If you don't, let me explain. There is nothing that terrifies a firefighter, and especially a spoke jumper, more than the words transitional zone. A transitional zone is where a forest fire, normally a forest fire, rarely moves at more than four or five miles an hour. That's why most firefighters are not afraid of forest fires, because they know that generally they can outrun the fire. But Man Gulch was part of a transitional stone. Now, this is an area where mountain forests transition to level plains and shoulder-high prairie grass. And in this case, the prairie grass was bone dry, and it was ready to explode when the flames hit it. Now, every firefighter knows you cannot outrain a prairie grass fire. So he sizes up the situation, and he realizes he and his men have about 60 seconds to live. And they're going to be completely engulfed in the fire. And when he tells this part of the story, it will make the hair stand up on your arms. He said in, in some of the trees that were around, it, the heat was so intense, you could hear the sap exploding like bombs in the air. He said ashes and, and embers were falling like snow. They couldn't hardly see each other. He said there was no escape. They were trapped. He said it looked like the only options we had were either to stand there and burn up, turn around and burn up, or run and burn up. He said, men, we've got 60 seconds to live. 
And he said the last thought he had before he knew he was going to die was, I'm out of options. Now, we've all been there. Some of you are in that, that situation right now. We've all been there where we've been surrounded by the fires of circumstances and situations where we just felt like there's just no way up. I, I just don't have any other option except to cheat on my income taxes. I, I just don't have any other option than to cheat on my spouse. I don't have any option but to cheat on my final exam. There are no options except to embezzle from the company or pad the expense account or compromise my convictions and do the wrong thing. I guess there's nothing left to do except give in and give out and give up. We are tonight talking about one of those situations where you think your choice box is empty. And you're saying, man, James, how do you know it's me? Because we've all been there. I promise you, there are men in this room tonight, you are just about ready to give up on your marriage. You're just about done. There's some of you in this room tonight, and you don't even have much of a, of a relationship with your mom or with your dad or with your parents, and you've about given up any hope of rebuilding any bridge whatsoever. Well, I want to say something tonight as we kind of start out, and I want this kind of just kind of hover in the room as we kind of get into this message. And that's this thought, guys. When you think you're out of options, there's always the God option. When you think you're out of options, there's always the God option. And so tonight, we're going to study one of the most familiar and famous stories in all the Bible. And the reason I love this story is it's so relevant to where the world is today, to where our nation is today, and to where the church is today. And I want to make a statement right now, and trust me when I say this. I'm not trying to be political. I, I'm not, that's not where I'm going with this at all. So it has nothing to do with politics. So whether you're a Democrat or a Republican or, or a Tennessee Vol that needs to get saved, it doesn't really matter to me. <laughs> in my 60 plus years of living, our nation is in the biggest trouble of my lifetime. You take any area you want to look at financially, Morally, spiritually, ethically, relationally, we are in the biggest trouble of our lifetime. And so tonight I want to look at the story of three men who were thrown into a fiery furnace. And why? They were thrown into the fiery furnace not because of standing for what was wrong, but for standing for what was right. Amen. Now you keep in mind when you read stories like this in the Bible that you're not just reading what God has done, you're reading what God is doing. You're not reading what God has said, you're reading what God is saying. You're not just reading how God wanted those men to stand up and be men then, you're reading about how God wants us men to stand up and be men now. So there's this great lesson that all who are going to follow Jesus, and if you're here tonight and you'd say, James, I'm a follower of Jesus. I want to be a follower of Jesus. I want to be known as a follower of Jesus. I want to stay true to his word. If that's true, then you better hear me tonight. We had better learn as we face the coming days and weeks and months and years right here in our nation. There's a lesson we all need to learn tonight, beginning with this guy right here, and this is the lesson. When facing the fire, take the heat. When facing the fire, take the heat. When you're confronted with a situation where you can either stand for what is right or compromise with what is wrong, there are three steps you need to take. And I, I'm just being honest. I wish I could tell every congressman what I'm going to talk about tonight. I wish I could tell every senator what I'm talking about tonight. Every governor, every mayor, whoever may be the next president of the United States, we need men and women who will stand up for what's right and stand against what is wrong and take the fire for doing so. So you say, well, James... How do you do that? How do you do that, James? All right, three things real quick because I'm on a clock, all right? Number one, take courage from God. Amen. Take courage from God. Now, there are three parts to this story. That's one reason I love the story. It kind of breaks up from those natural three points that I love to do. So it really breaks up into three parts, and the story is pretty much set up in the first six verses. Daniel chapter 3, verse 1. King Nebuchadnezzar made an, an image of gold whose height was 60 cubits and its breadth 6 cubits. He set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then King Nebuchadnezzar sent to gather the satraps, the prefects, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then the satraps, the prefects, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, 
the magistrates and all the officials of the provinces gathered for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up and the herald proclaimed aloud, you are commanded, O peoples, nations, languages. When you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, every kind of music, you are to fall down and worship the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. Now, if you're not familiar with that story, maybe you don't read the Bible very much, let me just kind of give you the background. Israel, because of their disobedience to God, had had the unthinkable happen to them. A pagan, unbelieving nation, Babylon, had taken Israel captive. Now, in turn, they had taken some of the finest men, a young men that Israel had to offer, and they brought them to the University of Babylon because they wanted to turn them into really classic Babylonian citizens. Now, the leader of Babylon was a man by the name of Nebuchadnezzar, who at that time was the most powerful ruler in all of the world. As a matter of fact, no one ever before or since has ever ruled over more people and more property than Nebuchadnezzar. So he was not only the commander-in-chief of the most powerful army on earth, he was also the high priest of political correctness. He wanted everyone to bow down to the same altar, everyone to worship the same God. He wanted to make sure that everybody was included, nobody was excluded, and the only thing that was not tolerated was anyone who would not tolerate what he wanted tolerated. I'm not going to say that again. All right, now... <laughs> So here's what he does. He, he lifts up this 60-foot golden image of this pagan god, and at the appointed time, he wants everyone to bow down and worship it. Now, it's, it's real plain, no exemptions, no exceptions. You can't call in sick. And by the way, you notice the list of dignitaries that was there. In fact, I was reading this the other day, and Teresa said to me, she said, what is a satrap? I said, I, I, said, well, I think that word means married man. And she said, well, how do you know that? Because I said, any married man knows if you say it, you're trapped. So <laughs> this guy, they, they had all of these dignitaries that were there. I mean, everybody who was somebody, a, a veritable political who's who, they were there. They were all there to join the cult of conformity and bow down to this pagan god. And I will tell you, it must have been a tremendous sight. I mean, people were being interviewed on Good Morning Babylon. CNN, the Chaldean News Network, they were all over the place because Nebuchadnezzar has established this brand new religion, this brand new God to be worshipped, and everybody, this is a pastor's dream, everybody is going to join the church at the same time because if you don't, you're going to be a crispy critter. So, the wind of demonic commandments collides with the wall of divine courage. And you got these three young Hebrew men. What a sight it must have been. Everybody else bows down. But these three men stick up like a sore thumb. Amen. Standing ramrod straight. Not making a big show of it. Not yelling. Not screaming. They're just standing up. Well, their actions were reported to the king down in verse 12. There are certain Jews whom you've appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, pay no attention to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Now, let's go back and think about this. Anybody and everybody who was somebody went along, fell in line. They went along to get along except these three young men. You talk about a profile in courage. Let me just tell you something. See, back when we were younger pastors, the big thing back then, you remember, was the moral majority. And people lament that we don't have a moral majority anymore. Let me, let me, give you, let me kind of give you a newsflash. Men, it doesn't take any courage to be a part of the moral majority. It takes courage to be a part of the moral minority. That's where it takes courage. And these men were not a part of the moral, moral majority. They were part of the moral, moral, uh, moral minority. Now, these young men, listen to what they could have done, because it's done all the time. They could have rationalized. They could have compromised so easily because we've heard it all before. For example, these three young men could have said, well, I just don't believe I ought to let my personal beliefs interfere with my politics. Or, um, well, you know, everybody else is doing it, so when, when in Babylon you do what the Babylons do. Oh, I love this one. 
Well, I, I just don't believe I ought to impose my morality on somebody else. Which, by the way, while I'm in the neighborhood, if you don't impose your morality on somebody else, they will certainly impose their immorality on you. The question is not, is, immorality, is morality going to be imposed? The question is, whose is going to be imposed? Or right, here's what they could have said. Hey, I'll bow down on the outside. I just won't bow down on the inside. Or right, here's one. Well, it's legal, so it must be right. So these three men, they do us a big favor. They show us what real faith is all about. Listen to this. Real faith means obeying God regardless of the feelings within us, the circumstances around us, or the consequences before us. That's faith. And one of the greatest lessons, that, listen, you guys, if you have children, or if you're like me, now you've got grandchildren, you will never teach your children a greater lesson than this, to stand alone for what is right, even if they stand alone. You'll never teach your sons a better lesson. You'll never teach your daughters a better lesson. Stand alone. Stand what is right even when you stand alone. And then you tell them this. Now, let me tell you the good news, honey. Hey, son, let me tell you this. When you stand alone, you never stand alone because God always stands with you. So number one, take courage from God. Number two, keep confidence in God. Now, Nebuchadnezzar, he, he hears about the disobedience of these three men, and boy, he loses it. I mean, his temperature is higher, and his temper is hotter than the fire in the furnace. And Nebuchadnezzar decides, all right, I'm going to give these guys a second chance. I, I, I'm going I'm to try to save their life. And so he calls these three young men together, and he says, boys, I'm going to make you an offer you can't refuse. Verse 15. Now, if you're ready... Now, they've heard this before. Now, if you're ready, when you hear the sound of the horn and the pipe and the lyre and the trigon and the harp and the bagpipe, bagpipe and every kind of music, to fall down and worship the image that I have made well and good. But if you do not worship, you shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. Now, listen to this next question. Listen. And who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? Now, man, I want you to listen to that last question. Because every time you're, caught, you're, you're tempted to give in, every time you're tempted to cut the corner, every time you're tempted to compromise, every time you're tempted to go along and get along, every time you're tempted to take the bait and get in line with everybody else, here's the question you're really going to be, be asked. Who is the God who will deliver you? Out of this situation. In other words, when everybody else is saying, you're going to get in line? You're going to go along to get along? You're going to walk the plank of political correctness? You're going to make sure you're popular even though you may not be right? God's always asking every one of us in that situation one question. Do you trust me or not? Yes. It's just that simple. It's not hard. It doesn't take a Ph.D. Do you really trust me or not? Do you really believe I am a God who delivers? Now look at this response. Verse 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. I love a sanctified smart aleck. I do. <laughs> I, I just do. I just love it. I mean, they didn't fear. They didn't flinch. They looked the king square in the eye. And listen, you notice they don't call him sire or king. They said, uh, Neb. <laughs> what we have here is a failure to communicate. <laughs> you see, the time for talk is over. So we don't think you've understood, so let us help you. This is not up for debate. And this is not up for discussion. And this is not up for deliberation. So, Neb, would you just, would you just draw up a little close? Get a little closer. Read our lips. We may burn, but we're not going to bow. Amen. We may burn, but we're not going to bend. We may burn, but we are not going to budge. 
Now, the reason why I love this, and you, you know this if you don't think about, about storms, in a storm, it's the tallest tree in the forest that's most likely to draw the lightning. So I want to just give all of us fair warning tonight. If you decide to take this passage seriously, and if you decide you're going to be a man of God that stands tall for God, you're going to stand for what's right, even if nobody else is doing so, I am telling you right now, you will draw the fire. Amen. I'm telling you right now, you will face fire. The heat. Now, had those three men been, had, 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 they, had they been in charge and they could have kind of run the show, they would have exercised any number of options. Maybe they would have had the golden image destroyed, or maybe they would have had Nebuchadnezzar retract the law, or maybe they would have caused the fire in the furnace to go out, or maybe they would have just simply given, been given an exemption. But at this point, here's one thing those three men know they know this. It's been made plain. They get it. They understand it. We are out. Of options. We have no other choice. He's got no place to go. So now what do they say? This just keeps getting better. What do they say? Verse 17. If this be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. And he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. Man, I love these guys. Gosh, I love these guys. Boy, Pastors, what if, what if every man in our church were like these men? Our churches would be so radically different. I mean, here's these three men, and they're, I mean, they're just a few feet and just a few seconds from walking into a fiery furnace. Are they going to walk in groaning and complaining, saying, woe is me? No. Nope. They say, we're going to walk in singing, what a mighty God we serve. We're going to walk in singing, how great is our God. We are not going to face this fire, this fire with fear. We're going to face it with faith. And you say, well, James... Why did they have such a great faith? Because they knew they were placing it in such a great God. Amen. They knew they served a God who is able to deliver. And men, if you don't believe anything else I've said tonight or hear anything else I've said tonight, please hear the next thing I'm going to say and please believe it. We don't just serve an ordinary dime of the dozen, run of the mill God. We serve a God who is able to deliver. Amen. He is able to deliver. Listen, scientifically. Our God is able to take nothing and turn it into everything. Amen. Emotionally, our God is able to take grief and turn it into glory. Physically, our God is able to take illness and turn it into wellness. Spiritually, our God is able to take a rebellious heart and turn it into a redeemed heart. Eternally, our God is able to take the sunset of death and turn it into the sunrise of resurrection. Our God is able. He's an able God. And listen, what they say next to me is one of the all-time great statements of faith in God in the entire Bible. Listen to verse 18. Listen to this. But if not, and I listen to that, but if not, be it known to you, O king, we will not serve your gods, and we will not worship the golden image that you have set up. Now, guys, put a circle around those words, but if not. You don't know what makes a great man a great man? Listen to this. You know what really makes a great man a great man? You know what made these men so great? They had already made up their mind and their heart. They had already decided what was right. They had already decided what was wrong. And so here's the problem with some of you men out there tonight. Too many men and too many people spend too much time trying to make up their mind what they're going to do when they're faced with a situation. When they're faced, you know, what am I going to do if, if, if you're told to give in, if you're told to give out, if you're told to give up? I got news for you. If you wait until that moment to decide, the battle's lost. Amen. Battle's lost. You had better make up your mind every day. You better make up your mind before you walk out this building and get into your car. You better make up your mind right now whether you're going to live for God or not. Amen. You better make up your mind whether you're going to obey God or not. You better make up your mind whether you're going to serve God or not. I learned a long time ago, guys, if you'll make one or two big decisions, you don't have to worry about all the little bitty decisions. They had already decided, we're going to choose the fire. I mean, if you're telling us the only choice we've got is to worship that stupid cement God or to burn, we're going to burn. We're going to take the heat because they knew that God could deliver them from the fiery furnace. Now, here's the catch. They really didn't know whether he would deliver them. You say, wait a minute, James. 
They had just said earlier, we know our God will deliver us. Well, oh yeah, here's what they were saying. Look, God's going to deliver us one way or the other. He'll either deliver us from the fire and we'll keep living for him, or he'll deliver us through the fire and we'll just go live with him. Doesn't matter. Either way, our God is going to deliver us. So we're going to stand with God whether we live or whether we die. I hear so many talk, people talk about what real faith is. Faith is this and faith is that. Guys, listen to me. Real faith is not the confidence that God will work things out the way you want. Real faith is the confidence that God will work things out the way he wants. And the truth of the matter is, when you stand for God, you may die. If you love God with all of your heart, you may, not, you may still not be healed of cancer. Faith is not believing that you'll live and not die. Faith is not believing that you'll be healed and not die. Faith is believing it is better to die than to live if it's God's will that you die. That's what real faith really is. You may believe God and you may still lose your job. But if that's okay, if it's God's will. See, a but if not faith understands this. We can't always be sure of what's going to happen. But we can always be, always be sure of who is controlling what's going to happen. Amen. See, we should have confidence. Disappointment does not mean God has disappeared. Death does not mean that God has failed. Difficulty does not mean that God is weak and things are out of control. So if you're in, if you're in this room right now and you're saying, James, do I ever need to hear this? I am, I, mean, I am this far from a fiery furnace in my life. I'm facing the fire right now. I'm so tempted to run. I'm so tempted, tempted to give up. I'm so tempted, tempted to compromise. I'm so tempted not to take the heat. Remember this. His eyes on the thermometer. His hand is on the thermostat. And we can take the heat when it comes. So, have confidence in God. Take courage from God. Here's the last thing. Honor commitment to God. Honor commitment to God. Now look at this. There's no small print in the contract of their commitment. Here's the way it's going to work. If God delivers them from the furnace, they're going to live for God. If he delivers them through the furnace, they're going to live with God. So whether they lived or whether they had died, they made a commitment to God. They said, we made a commitment. We told you, God, we made a promise. We will never bow to any other God but you. And no matter what it costs us, we are going to honor that commitment. Well, Nebuchadnezzar had an equally strong commitment to his God. He said, okay, you had your chance. You blew it. You say you're willing to take the heat. Well, I'll tell you, I'm willing to give it. Now, what this king did not know was the fun is now about to start. He heats the furnace up seven times hotter than usual. He's made a determination. I'm going to set the Guinness World Book of Records for how fast you can go from rare to well done. I'm going to make it happen just like that in the flash of an eye. And he says, I want the smell of your cooking flesh to be a reminder to everyone else. You better step in line and you better stay in line or you'll be next. Well, here's what happened, verse 23. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they fell bound under the burning fiery furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and he rose up in haste. He declared to his counselors, did we not cast three men into the fire? And they answered and said to the king, true, O king. He answered and said, but I see four men unbound walking in the midst of the fire. And they're not hurt. And the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. Now, they throw these three men into this furnace. And all of a sudden, this fourth man is there. Now, biblical scholars, you can go look it up, they kind of debate whether this was the Son of God or someone like a Son of God. And there are many who believe the reason this looked like the Son of God is because it was the Son of God. That's what I think. I believe that this was an Old Testament appearance of the New Testament Jesus. That's what I think. But regardless, regardless, Nebuchadnezzar now realizes, you know what? These guys can stay in there all day. There's not going to be a barbecue tonight. They're not going anywhere, and they're certainly not cooking so he waves the white flag of surrender, and we read this, verse 26. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the door of the burning fiery furnace. He declared, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, 
servants of the Most High God, come out and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out from the fire. Now you do the math. Verse 24 tells us that three men went into the fire, right? You can count them. Larry, Moe, Curly, Joe, they're all there. <laughs> Verse 25 tells us there were four men in the fire. Verse 26 tells us that three men came out of the fire. All right, now you look like reasonably intelligent men to me for the most part. So I'll ask you a question. So if three men went in, but four men were there, and three men came out, where does that leave the fourth guy? He said, well, James, he's still in the fire. Right. Because you see, when you take the heat for God, he's waiting to take the heat with you. When you take the heat for God, he's waiting to take the heat. You know what he says? Come on in. It's great. It's better than the beach. We'll have a wonderful time of fellowship. You just come on in. Listen, Adrian Rogers used to say it, Steve, you know this. Jesus did not come into the world to get us out of trouble. He came to get into trouble with us. You never need, listen, that's why, guys, you never need to fear the furnace. Now, think about this. Let's run the tape back. So let's suppose that these boys do what everybody else did. Let's suppose they kept their mouth shut. Let's suppose they decide to mind their own business. Let's suppose they decide they don't want to stir things up. So they get in line and they do what they're told. Well, on the one hand, they would not have been thrown into the furnace, right? That's, that's the one positive, if you want to call it a positive. They would not have been thrown into the furnace. But let's go to the other side of the ledger. If they had done that, I would have had to have found another text. And we would have never heard about the three men that I had a Sunday school teacher called Shadrach, Meshach, and the Billy Goat. We would have never heard of these guys. And furthermore, if they had not been thrown into that furnace, they would have never experienced the presence of God. They would have never enjoyed the power of God. They would have never been enveloped by the protection of God. And see, when you're tempted to take the coward's way out, forsake your convictions, compromise your integrity, here's what you just did. You just took God out of the picture. You just decide to go it alone. Listen, you know what a fiery furnace is? Can I tell you what it is? Fiery furnaces are divine opportunities to show what a mighty God he is. That's what a fiery furnace is. See, this story tells me, if it doesn't tell me anything else, with God, I can face any furnace. With God, I can take any heat. Oh, by the way, Remember those firefighters that we talked about at the beginning of the message? You know, the guys that we thought were out of options? Well, it turns out they weren't. Because the best part of the story and the rest of the story is just amazing. 60 seconds to go. Sap's exploding. Ashes are falling like rain. Heat's intensifying. It looks like they're doomed. And all of a sudden... This man takes out a match, lights it, and throws it into the shoulder-high grass that's in front of him. His men thought he's lost his mind because in an instant, this grass began to burn. It was ablaze in an ever-widening circle. And as the ring of this new fire spread, it cleared a small area of everything flammable. It wasn't much of a safety zone, but it was all that they had. He turned to his 15 men and he said, men, follow me. He jumped into that blazing ring, moved to the very center of it, told the men to lie down and join him, wrapped a wet cloth around his face, got down on the ground, and waited. Sure enough, the surging firewall came all the way around that circle, and then it leapt over the top because there was nothing left to burn. And he said later, not a hair on his head was even singed. Now you say, boy, James, that's a great story. Well, yeah, but it doesn't have a totally happy ending. Because 13 of those men didn't listen to him. And they cut and run. And they burned and died. And the only three men who were saved were the men who realized that the fire can never go where the fire has already been. 
Only the men who were willing to take the heat live to talk about it. Amen. Now, last thing. 2,000 years ago, Jesus walked into a fiery furnace in the shape of a cross. He took the heat of God's wrath against our sin so that we could be forgiven and we could be redeemed from the fire of death and we could receive the light of eternal life. Jesus knows all about fiery furnaces. He's been there, done that, bought the t-shirt, owns the factory. And this Jesus, who by the way is alive and well today, Amen. this Jesus, this resurrected Jesus is saying to every man in this room, he would say it to every congressman and congresswoman if they would just listen. He would say it to every governor and every mayor if they would just listen. He would say to every senator if they would just listen. He would say to any president of the United States if they would just listen. Don't be afraid of the fire. You take the heat. I will be in there with you. And it's better to be in the fire in my will than outside the fire outside of my will. And I'm telling you tonight, men, if for no other reason, Every time you get the chance to take the heat for him, you take it because he took the greatest heat that there is. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for three men, three young men who stood up when everybody else bowed down, who spoke up when everybody else shut up, who did not go along to get along, who said, live or die, we're going to trust you and obey you and stand for you. Lord, help us to be men like that in this day and age in which we live. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.